All right, take three. <laughs> <laughs> Sudden oak death, take three. Uh, this is Siege, my neighbor, and uh, we're just looking at some of their trees today. They have the same problem I have and a lot of other people in the area, which is sudden oak death. This is a disease co caused by an uh, organism called Phytophthora rumorum. It's a fungus, and we'll talk about the pathology of it in a minute, but it's a real problem. They call it uh, sudden oak death for a reason. The trees uh, get infected, and they're kind of like, are infected for a while, but then all of a sudden it hits a critical point and the tree just dies. Now with tan oak in particular, it has these really heavy, dense leaves, and these things burn like crazy. You know, they actually have a, a really high fuel value, as you can see, like there. So you mm -hmm. get this thing where suddenly this huge tree just covered in these giant leaves dies, and it's just a huge torch. So you can imagine if that caught on fire and there's like, you know, 10 in the area, it would just, it's just going to be a, a huge firestorm. So they're looking at identifying these trees. Uh, marking them and then maybe getting someone in to cut some of them out uh, because there's a whole lot of them and in particular in this area some of the felling is actually pretty tricky not something that a novice should probably attempt like it's daunting to me I'm kind of like you know okay with a chainsaw and felling so that's what we're doing and we're just gonna walk around and talk about trees and this disease and potential things to do about it we'll just see it because I've looked at it a couple times yeah um, that doesn't mean it's not there it might just be hidden deep in this um, big fissured thick bark. I mean that bark could be this thick. It could be two inches thick, uh -huh. even more. Sometimes the biggest trees won't show it uh, early and the small trees actually show it early. Even though the disease often gets into these fissures as a, a place where it starts, for some reason it, the young trees with the thin bark may show it. So I would really like to be able to drop this tree which may happen this summer. Uh, Gregor and I already talked about it just because it's fun because it's such a big tree on here. I guess it caught big trees down and there's a lot of neat wood in there that could potentially be used for something. Mm -hmm. So let's go look at some of the um, smaller trees. Here's a really obvious one down here. Sometimes it's very very obvious like this and other times it's really not obvious at all. And this bleeding this kind of red bleeding and you'll see like, you'll see sometimes just a minimal amount of staining at the cracks and not all this huge bleeding. So this is real, real obvious here. So let's just actually cut into that bark so I can show you what's, what's happening underneath the bark. Okay, so this is basically a big lesion of dead, dead bark and it goes all the way to the wood. You can see up here, like this might be a little diseased but it's not dead yet. And is it here. that red color that is the indication, or this is it darker, the dark? The darker. So the red is. This typical. is more close to like a normal, healthy it is. looking okay. bark. Like, yeah, normally the bark would be kind of a light, healthy pink uh, color, but this is definitely like I cut right into that, you know, area. Like this would be the same here, and you get these big dark patches. So anyway. And is tan oak um, specifically have that color, or all oaks have that pink? They're usually similar. Uh, some will be definitely different shades of reddish and pinkish, uh, tending towards white. It just depends on the bark. The age of the bark, I mean, tan oak in particular is called tan oak because it's used for tanning leather. It has a high tannin content and real thick bark, so other trees will have more or less of that. So the way the disease works is the tree can have these lesions and be fine. But once the lesions connect enough, like they'll, they'll grow and they expand and they start to connect and then eventually it just chokes off all the resources from the top of the tree and then okay. it dies. And so looking up, I don't necessarily see a lot of dead branches up above that this right, is the Right, because this one marker. hasn't hit the critical point yet, but it's obviously you know close. Uh -huh. And also if you look out here, the leaves are thin and they're yellowing out of the tip. So it's definitely not, you know, you can see up there that it's not healthy. And of course down here it's real obvious. So a major problem with these is if you leave them, um, they die. And they used to think like when they, this problem first started, they actually thought it was a bug disease because the beetles would move in so fast that they thought the beetles were actually killing the trees. Mm. You can get beetles in these and even within, I've seen probably in just a little over a year, I've seen big trees like this just break like halfway up. And so, what exactly is it? Is it a bacteria? Is it a it's a fungus. Fungus. Yeah. Okay. 
So if you leave these trees and then go to cut them, they're, they're really, really hazardous to, fall, to fell because they could break while they're falling and fold backwards and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, so you really want to get them before they've sta been standing dead for too long. And um, we can still use the wood for firewood even though it has the fungus. It, it doesn't spread um, any toxins. If it's burned for human use, the wood is burned. It's not a problem. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, you can even transport it if you remove the bark or dry it thoroughly, according to the plant pathologist I talked to. So this guy, plant pathologist came out, um, Jack Marshall, he's like a California state. Uh, every time I hear his name, I, I want to go, Jack Marshall. <laughs> like, is it such a, like a ranger? Yeah. You know, he's like a ranger. <laughs> Jack Marshall, he's Jack Marshall. <laughs> Anyway, he's a plant pathologist, and he said that as long as you dry it, like the, the official line is if you dry it, you can transport it. And, and it won't be contagious to others. I'm a little more careful than that, personally, yeah. because I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. But that's what, it, that's what he says. As far as you guys burning it here, absolutely no problem. Probably every tan oak in this grove is going to get it. You know? <sighs> I mean, that's just how it is. He said there is at the time, this was maybe four or five years ago, mm -hmm. he said there was no known resistance in tan oaks, wow. no known genetic resistance, as far as I know. And Other it, trees get it, but they don't get it as bad or as, it's not as much of a death sentence. That he was like, if you see this, you know, you might as well just cut it down now. Is the fungus going, moving underground through the root structure? Is that how He it says that's one of the ways it spreads. The other one is um, by, airborne like he said it will actually move on on the mist and stuff wow and wow. what one thing you'll see a lot like the first place you'll see it in a, in a new area usually mm -hmm. is the small tan oaks underneath bay trees because the bay tree is a carrier it doesn't really affect the tree that much health wise but it moves it. but it grows on the yeah. leaf and then the water drips off the end of the leaves and any tan oak underneath those will almost always get infected pretty early. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving around and you see like a big, these little dead tan oaks like you have some in the driveway here, a lot of times you'll notice there's a bay over the top of them. So possibly I think the bay is catching it, propagating it and then dripping it mm -hmm. down. And he said any plan to control it in an area starts with murdering all of the bay trees. It's kind of like kill the forest to save the trees and they're probably going to get it anyway. So the only treatment I know of is for sure is this fungicide. Thing. I think you have to apply it every year and it's fairly expensive and of course it's a you know it's not a permanent solution mm -hmm. but for you know something like this those, that ring of trees over there yeah. it could be worth considering. Because it's more of a precious yeah. kind of Right. Yeah. There was a, a study many years ago that claimed that the areas that they studied, an area that was burned within the last 50 years, like a, like a, fire, a forest mm -hmm. fire, was um, showing resistance or immunity or something like that to the disease. Huh. So that's the only other thing. I have a tree at my house that it's where I tan leather, mm -hmm. so I'm always dumping lime and wood ashes there. And then we've actually on purpose dumped extra wood ashes around to see if that will have an effect. And so far it hasn't shown any signs, so hmm. fingers crossed. But that's the other thing you could potentially look into for like a specimen tree that you want to save. But mm -hmm. overall, you know, we just can't do that everywhere and um, we're kind of screwed. This is what we're stuck with. Hmm. The thing that's really sad is that this is a cornerstone species. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. So if all of these oaks were to die, it would completely change this ecosystem. Yeah, right? very much so. Like this is the most reliable mast tree that we have, mast M-A-S-T, meaning, you know, source of like uh, starchy feed. For animals, yeah. birds. Yeah, or... I mean, bears, uh, deer eat a lot of them, uh -huh. uh, of course, squirrels, turkeys, uh, uh -huh. all kinds of birds, major food source. Mm -hmm. And the other oaks, you know, they bear acorns, but they're really not that consistent. Would this then turn into grassland eventually, or what? what no, would... because um, it, you can see there's a lot of madrones in here too. The madrones uh -huh. and the bays and the firs are going to get in and take over. It's I just going to be less diverse, basically. Yeah. The tan oaks are native, or are they non native? I heard there was a theory that they actually came over, maybe were brought over from Siberia. There's a related species in Japan called the stone oak. Mm -hmm. um, who knows? Yeah. They, they've been here a real long time and they're 
you know, worked into the ecosystem well. I do want to do a large scale project, possibly replacing them with chestnuts as an experiment just in a small area because they're related, they grow a little bit similar, they probably associate with similar fungi because that's the other thing uh -huh. that all the best, or most of the best uh, gourmet mushrooms that grow on the ground are associated with hanok and they have a relationship with hanok. So the black trumpets, the orange and white chanterelles, uh, probably the porcini, all the good stuff uh, could become very yeah, it would uncommon. wipe them out too if yeah. we lost them. Also the tree fungus, lots and lots of tree fungus is ideal for growing mushrooms. And that's one of the potential uses for these trees. Right. Like, Well, we, we have mean, some mushrooms growing down right. the road that we, we put the spores in yeah. last season. Right, just off this property alone, yeah. which I'm real familiar with. I mean, I know how much tan oak is up in these, hill, these hillsides. Mm -hmm. Uh, you could have a small industry for a little while <laughs> growing mushrooms. Also, the tan bark. The tan bark's amazing. I mean, I use it to tan leather uh -huh. um, all the time, and it's it's amazing stuff. So it's kind of, for me, in that way, too, it's the end of an era. You know, I've been trying to stock it up yeah. as much as I can. So there's those two things, and there's also uh, char production for biochar is another major one. And all this slash... And just the wood itself, I mean, there's a huge potential to make uh, char, which can be sold or just applied, you know, locally or whatever. What's biochar? Depends on who you ask. But to me, it's uh, any kind of charred plant material that's used in the soil is a soil amendment to improve the soil. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think in this county in general, if people would do something besides grow weed and wine, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there's like a huge potential to form a local industry off this fact that these trees are dying even if they weren't you could form the same industry around the live trees and you know sustainably harvesting them mm -hmm. because when you cut them down they grow back you're going to get it's a like mess you're going to get a mess of suckers but yeah. from people that have had sod for a long time what i've gathered is that they what will happen is they'll grow for a few years and then eventually they'll start to be affected mm -hmm. so what we want for you now anyway you know aside from all that is to be able to identify mm -hmm. these trees. Identify if you guys are removing these dead trees, be really, really careful if you don't know what you're doing. Um, even if you do, it's just dangerous. Yeah. Okay. Let's find some more trees and, and look at some maybe uh, slightly more subtle right. uh, signs. But on this side, it's, it's blatantly obvious. Right. Yeah, it means. Yeah, let's look at this right here. Poor tree is bleeding. See. It shows yeah, you. Yeah, look at. Wow. That stuff. Now there is something else that happens that tends to be more of a black staining, which I don't think this is is that, but there's kind of a bacterial thing that happens where you'll see some black stains. It's often around where there's a water reservoir mm -hmm. that forms, like in the crotch of a tree or something. But, it's more um, like moisture. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't cut down a tree yet where I was wrong that, you know, that it was infected once I got in there and looked at the bark and everything. But it could happen. But given that these trees are probably all going to get sick anyway, you know, I don't I don't think you need to be too worried about, you know, making Removing mistake. one. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So it's that like all, lead red. Yeah. The That's bark, so crazy. the bark in these size of trees is just amazing. Like how yeah. dark red it is. And look at that. You and does this? that have to do That's with beetles. the tannin, or is that not? That's related? beetle frost right there. So this is already has beetles in it. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's the tannin. Like it is. the color is not some synonymous with the tannin content completely. There's other like dye principles in the bark, uh -huh. but it definitely is an indicator. You know, it's part of the color. For sure. Yeah, to me, to get to harvest bark like this, like this is a perfect time of year to get it, um, is super valuable. So, what's if, the process of getting the tannins from the bark? You boil it? Or? Yeah, you cook, cook it out or soak it out. Uh -huh. But these are actually pretty straightforward. But once those cars are out of the way, there's right. not much in the way. It takes so. a lot of time. To yeah, I mean, I would love to cut them. this down just because, like I said, I don't get to cut big trees down so it's kind of like exciting to yeah me. if i can get my bigger saw running and uh have enough energy I, i'd actually be into doing some of this felling for you guys just Good for the experience uh slash like resources that i can get some of the wood yeah. Yeah. i was kind of hoping to find one where there's there you're just starting to see this bleeding just a little bit 
like you'll just see a tree with maybe like a small stain coming out of a crack. But as you look at more and more of them, you'll, you'll start to get more confident. And if you're pretty sure that you want to check, you can just take it, like you know, take a hatchet and cut it like I did and you'll see the lesion. Okay, so this was barely showing signs of infection on the surface of the bark, like just some real kind of red specks. And it's just getting started, but like in a short time, this will be dark, real dark colored and uh, starting to bleed more. But you can see how it's spreading like that. See that? Mm -hmm. There's an older lesion. And then once those connect around, they just suddenly the resources stop Spring coming out the up tree. the tree. But you know, in this case where you have like a cluster of trees that are basically connected and one has it, I would probably just cut them all down. Yeah. But you could also wait till next year and wait till this shows signs, but it probably will by next year. You'll get better at identifying it. And like I said, you're gonna have so much to keep you busy this year that it's obvious that um, you won't really need to be identifying marginal trees that are maybe just starting to show signs. Mm -hmm. It can go really, really fast sometimes, and other times it takes uh, years before the tree finally succumbs. Oh. And again, with the big trees, it's pretty hard to tell, like they might be infected and not showing it very much for mm -hmm. quite a long time. And is there, is this just part of nature, this fungus, or is there any reason why these trees are, well, I mean, they're obviously their particular they're less immune, but is there anything else that contributes to them being more Well, it depends on who you ask, but I'd be careful what I believe regarding that. There is a theory that it's uh, fire suppression and that the fires are natural, and if they happened often enough, it doesn't mean that nature has a plan that way. It's uh -huh. just maybe it's worked out that way, but the yeah. fungus is new. So it's not like the fungus was here and the trees were healthy. The uh -huh. fungus was introduced and it's attacking the trees. It started further south and, you know, people saw entire forests and hillsides like in Marin County and stuff just wiped uh -huh. out. Right. So we've known what's gonna happen. Like when I moved here, I knew it was coming even though it wasn't here at all. And introduced within five years it was here. By, from other? I think it came from another country. Uh -huh. Just in terms of like, dealing with the problem without even using the res it's not necessary to use the resources just for fire danger you could just drop the trees uh quickly lend them and try to get the brush to lay close to the ground like get you know maybe a machete so a couple yeah. people with machetes and just kind of trim the rust just enough Flatten so it, it lays well let's chop and drop you know enough that it lays pretty flat to the ground yeah. and then it'll rot down if you just leave big piles of limbs they'll be there for years and years uh -huh. and they're their own fire hazard and then the you know the trunks they're beneficial to the forest to just have dead big trunks laying around for bugs and critters and uh well siege that's that. well, well siege that's about what i have to offer you today gosh i learned a lot thanks you're welcome <laughs> just remember the forest is your friend <laughs> kind of actually the forest is indifferent which is good because that that uh is something we can understand. It's a, a predictable universe. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you feel sad about having to cut down all these trees oh, on God, your yeah. property? Oh God, yeah. But I've kind of been through the mourning period. Like yeah. I said, when I moved here, I knew this was going to happen, right. and I knew what it meant. You know, yeah. I, I, you it know. didn't deter you, though. No, no, not at all. Because it's you know the forest will still be here, and there will be a forest. Yeah. But seriously, like a lot of my activities and interest in the place, everything from hunting squirrels. Mm -hmm and you know for food and uh tanning the leather i use them for shade mm -hmm. like i just have a an attachment like an emotional attachment to mm -hmm. the tree from a long association they yeah. actually like i understand this tree from the inside out like in a really visceral mm -hmm. way that has relevance to my life mm -hmm. so but yeah i knew it was going to happen so i kind of already went through the worst of the morning period and now i'm i'm kind of resigned what's what are the steps i don't know i'm, 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 I'm <laughs> like pretty far grief. along in the stages yeah, of grief acceptance what what i want is um i feel like i'm in a, in a unique position to make some content and material to like help people understand mm -hmm. what this tree means aside from just a name yeah. because we have like levels of involvement with our environment like mm -hmm. the the first level is of course not having no clue like you bring someone out and right. they have no idea what any tree is how the forest grows it's just like the super foreign environment yeah. and usually pretty scary 
And then, you know, you might go on a nature walk and say, oh, I learned what the trees are. That's a fir tree. That's a tan oak tree, mm -hmm. right? And that's like a next level. And then the next level might be learning, oh, like, I know that this tree has been used for things. Like, I know that, you know, that uh, there's things this tree can be used for. And then the deeper levels are basically like, is this tree part of my daily life? Like, what does this tree mean to me? Like, you know, and my survival or yeah. like Living in how I actually live, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's that's something that's just completely uncommon but i'd like to try to communicate that to people before you know this dies it's like they're living ghosts you know i walk through here and it's yeah. like okay well that won't you know that won't be there this is gonna be soon. a cemetery soon yeah kind yeah. of something like that but at the same time you know things will go on and it'll just change mm -hmm. so so we're checking out this uh grove they call it the cathedral tree this is uh this phenomenon, you see it in redwoods a lot, where there's a big tree in the middle and it dies, and then suckers sprout up around the outside of the stump, which tan oak does really well. And um, they grow back, and these just happen to grow into these huge um, trees. It's hard to tell right now what the scale is. But, uh, well, when do you walk in there? This scale there, they're pretty, pretty big. Pretty big. Yeah. So, of course, everybody's worried that this is going to get the disease and die. And I don't see any reason that it wouldn't get it. Well, look over here. Okay, now this could be what I was talking about with, you see how this is like a, a right. cavity that catches right. water? So but I, that looks Yeah, red. I do see some maybe bleeding right there. Oh, yeah. Let's look at from here. Oh. But let's look bell. around the rest of the tree. Okay. Oh yeah, not good. See, last time I was here, that wasn't there. And over there, I guess. Right here. Oh. Too bad. So sad. Yeah. I would probably cut them down early and try to mill them and just make the best of it, honestly. Well, you could, uh, but I really. Not the tree's not gonna work. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking it won't work. What's the process of treating one? I don't think there is one for tan oaks. You know, there's a guy with a a, a website called Sudden Oak Life, and he does treat oak trees, and he'll cut out the cankers, and then he'll apply calcium and nutrients and stuff, and try to revitalize and help get the tree healthy. There's almost no mention of even the word tan oak that I, when I looked on his site, and I wrote him at least once asking, like, what about tan oaks, and I didn't get any response. So, different oaks. different oaks, like live oaks, that get it a little bit, but they're not as bad. Black oaks get it. Apparently, the Oregon white oak is is uh, immune, and I would think that maybe the valley oaks are immune too. There's a lot of species of oaks here, but this is definitely the one that's really susceptible. I should come here and take some pictures with the wide angle lens. Well, that was interesting. Uh, pretty cool to connect with those guys and uh, help them out with their problem there. I'm glad they're, you know, they're kind of trying to move on it and do something about it. And uh, their property is really quite large, actually, and most of it's much steeper with a lot, lots and lots of sick tan oaks. So really, you know, practically speaking, there's not any way they, they're going to be able to keep up with the problem. Just like I won't be able to keep up with the problem. I should have been cutting lots and lots of trees the last couple of years, just have not been able to pull it off with other priorities and stuff. So that's just how it is. But uh, it's pretty, pretty bad. It's pretty devastating in multiple levels uh, what's happening to those trees. The homestead from up on the road. Look at that. 